This is my favorite dungeon in any Zelda game, ever. I've played... There's only a few I have. I haven't played Skyward Sword. I haven't played, like, the CDI games, which I guess most people don't even count. Uh, we're gonna need those. We're gonna need... This. And let's go. Played a lot of Zelda dungeons in my day. The Water Temple in Ocarina of Time is my favorite. The main gimmick of the dungeon is a little trite. It's just, you know, raising and lowering the water levels. And it's a very crude way of doing it. There's three spots in the dungeon where you can play Zelda's Lullaby to raise the water level to particular points. And the main goal of the dungeon is identifying which water level you need in order to complete each path of the dungeon. This is considered the most hated dungeon in Ocarina. It's like an internet meme how badly this dungeon is hated amongst Zelda players. And in fact, whenever we get to talking about Zelda dungeons in Let's Plays or on forums or in my Twitch stream or wherever I talk about video games, whenever somebody, the, the topic of best or worst Zelda dungeon comes up, I always have somebody go, Really? Water Temple? That's your jam? It is. I mentioned a little bit about why this Water Temple uh, is a little more cumbersome. And I'm going to demonstrate why. You've got to... You've got to use, you've got to toggle your iron boots on and off about 736 times over the course of this temple. If I'm wearing the iron boots, I can walk underwater like this. If I'm not, I float up like this. So here's how much time it takes to, like, say I wanted to turn off my boots here. And then as, as soon as I turn them off, I realize I didn't want to turn them off. I have to turn them back on and sink back down. Here's how that goes in Ocarina of Time 3D. Ready? Here we go. That's it. That's the whole process. If this were the N64 version, the original game, it would be like this. Go to here. Turn off the thing. Go back. Oh, wait a minute. That's not what I wanted to do. We gotta go back again. Turn it on like that. That's how you swap the boots. The difference is this game has super fast menus. The menus all pop up instantly. Instantly. Like, so fast, my recording software is actually having problems keeping up with the frame rate of it. N64, you were looking at up to a full second to get into your submenu, and then like half a second between screens. So, okay, the second thing this dungeon does in the 3D version is they add in visual markers like this. They show you, okay, this is the path to the lowest water level. It's yellow, and we're going to line it like this so you can't lose track of it. That wasn't in the original version either, and it made the whole dungeon more confusing just from the standpoint of what do I have to do and where do I have to go. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed getting really stuck and really lost and really having to think hard about what room do I need to get to. I need to get closer than that to my the Ocarina thing here. Here, here we go. X, A, Y, X, A, Y. Uh, like, okay, I've got to come back to this room and put the water level at a particular point. So how do I get there from where I am? The way I thought of it as a kid, and when, the way I thought of it again when I streamed this game on Twitch, is, okay, each of the three levels of the temple, because we do indeed have three levels, basically has four doors at each of the compass directions, Okay. Uh, they want me to use the bow and arrow here to light these two torches, but... Ain't nobody got time for that. We use Din's Fire. Get them both at once. I really enjoyed that. Being lost and then getting myself unlost by examining the map carefully. Realizing where I hadn't yet been. Remembering where these rooms were where I could change water levels. Some people didn't appreciate that, though. Some people just got lost in the temple, and their memory of it is... Because if, you, if you're just kind of going through the, the, the motions here, if you're not paying really close and careful attention to 
where everything is and how all the paths fit together, what you can end up doing is just getting trapped in this cycle of doing all three of the water levels repeatedly and going around and around in a circle. That's what a lot of people, their memories of this temple are. And that's where a lot of those, like, see right here? We have a key now. It's showing us here. The second water level is red, and this is the door that goes to it. And we can't go there with the water level... Uh, we, we, in other words, we have to have the water level completely drained. Otherwise, this wooden block would be floating way up above us there. You can see the two other floors of the water temple and where this block ends up with each, uh, at each water level. I'm going to blow this up. My bombs ended up not being a problem. I was kind of worried about my bomb situation, but they ended up being okay. Whoa. The only weapon they let you use underwater is the hookshot. So we've got that going for us. I think that the changes to this dungeon were good. That they 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 marked the critical path of the water levels. That was a good thing. That made the dungeon better. So the combination of that The combination of that... Oh, is it just a Skull Tool in here? You know what? I don't feel like hookshotting this one. Let's take care of these Crabmans first. Get them out of there. Let's do this. Let's backflip to collect the hook... The, uh, Skull Tool. Yeah, backflip to collect the hookshot. That's what I meant. Uh, is that all this room wants is a Skull Tool? That's fine, then. They're an objective good, the changes that were made. Marking the critical path, it only makes the dungeon slightly... It doesn't make it any easier. You still have to realize where you want the water level, how have it... Like, which height of water opens with which paths from which direction, you know? Because sometimes you want to be on floor two with the water at floor two, so everything there is drained from your perspective. Sometimes you want to be at floor two with the water at level three, in order to do some some actions in floor two while you're submerged. You still have to make all of those judgments. And then you got stuff like this block, which we're going to have to play with this block from a couple of different angles. We're going to have to remember that we pushed it, where we pushed it, where it went, what we can do with it later. Like, there's a lot of... a lot of that in the game. And the only thing that marking the... The water level chambers it does is to help the player keep that stuff in mind. I don't want to play with you at all. You can go ahead and jump into the void down here. That's great. Last thing I want to do is jump across this gap. And get knocked into the hole by a spider. Can you tell that's happened to me a million times? Uh, yeah, we want to be in this room. We got, we got, like, water currents in this room. I think what we want to do is drop down here. I'm going to get lost in this dungeon. I've never done Water Temple without having to do a bunch of backtracking before. Oh, you know, we want to get in here before the thing closes. Even if we get... There we go. Even if it does cause us to take some damage, because otherwise we've got to do this twice... Ain't nobody want to do this twice? So that is an objective good. Just to make a small change to help the player. It doesn't help them solve the dungeon. All it does is, okay, when I need to finagle the water levels, where they are in the map is going to be clearly marked for me. And actually, they're not marked on your map. They're only marked on the dungeon walls. You still have to be observant enough to notice where the paths are marked as you're going around in the dungeon. I think we need three keys before we can change the water. Maybe only two. I don't, I don't know. I really don't. Uh, but hey, if we get a little bit lost, I've been saying this whole time how much I enjoy getting lost in Zelda dungeons, so put my money where my mouth is. There's one change that they did make that I don't think they should have made. That I'm 
I'm pretty sure the N64 version doesn't do this. Oh, we can't crawl out of here. We gotta... See that? I put my I took my boots off when I didn't want to. What, the actual way to get out of here is to use your hook shot. That would have been about a five second loss. They're going into the menu and out of the menu and into the menu and out of the menu. If this were the N64 version. But this room over here... I guess we went around the long way. That's fine. This is going to be... This is our middle water level room. We're going to hookshot our way up here. To the platform where we can raise the water level to the midpoints. Watch what the game does here. So it raises the level for us. We see the block floating up. And then the camera zooms to show you the path. No! I'm like 80% certain the N64 version doesn't show you that. And you have to think about... Like, once you actually find the dungeon map, like, there's a room down there. How am I going to get to that room? And then think about how these floating wooden, like, blocks interact with water levels. I don't think the camera should pan down and show you that. I think that should be the puzzle. Like, the player has to... Oh, this is going to just fill the room with garbage, right? Yeah, we're just going to fill the room with garbage here. Time to take out the trash. With a hook shot. The onus should be on the player to think to look there and have that be the puzzle. So not every change that Ocarina of Time 3D made was unilaterally, unilaterally good. Unless I'm misremembering, and the N64 version also does that same camera pan to show you that path. But I'm pretty sure it doesn't. I'm pretty sure it just raises the water level for you, and that's it. That's a little too much help. That's doing the player's job for him. In my perspective. Because if you don't find that path, you're going to miss this key. Which means you're going to get further enough in the dungeon later on. Like, get some... Maybe find your way all the way to the dungeon item, fight the mid-boss, maybe pick up the compass, maybe find the boss. Like, but you're going to get to a point where you don't have a key. Well, now I've got to look at my map, figure out where could this key be hiding. And then once you find it, figure, okay, I've got, I see what room the treasure box is in. It's probably my key. How can I get to that room? What's above it? Well, okay, it's this room. Well, there's not an obvious path leading from this room. Oh, actually, we do want to go back down now. We do want to go... Because the water is at the second level now, we're going to go ahead and land on those spikeities. Now, if we go back into the room where we met with Princess Haruto, who has grown up into a very shapely and handsome young Zora lady with uh, boob scales... <clears throat> You'll, you'll see the boob scales when we find Rudo again. You won't be able to ever unsee them after you... after Now that the word boob scales is in your head, you will never be able to unsee them. But this is another key here. These two keys, the one beneath the, the center chamber that we just got, and this one here, I imagine are the keys that give most players trouble. Because you technically don't need either of these keys until the very end of the dungeon. Like, you can get... All of the dungeon equipment, the boss key, open up the path to the boss, and then, oh, there's a small key door in the way. I'm missing a small key. Because you really have to think of this passage down here and how it connects to the one up here, which we're going to go into now, and why you would need to have the water level at the second level instead of at the top or the bottom. It really has to, you've got to put some thought into it. A lot of Zelda dungeons, even ones that I really like. I think there's a crab man in this room. We're going to find out. Oh, I guess not. I guess there's not a crab. Oh, this must be the compass then. Okay. This is just the compass. We're fine. Although the compass is pretty much mandatory in this dungeon since... Uh, I finally use an arrow. It's pretty much mandatory in this dungeon, since finding all these little treasure boxes and all these just little out-of-the-way rooms... Having the boxes marked on your map is pretty much a mandatory for your first clear of this dungeon. 
Oh, I forgot the spikes were there. It's fine, though. A little bit of spikes never hurts nobody. That, that's a lie. Spikes, that's literally all they ever do is hurt people. Okay, so we're going to... I can't hookshot this, right? No. This is why we do Forest Temple first. Without Forest Temple, we'd be locked right here. But our hookshot is not long enough to grab that far wall, and that door does not stay open long enough to get through it. So we'll remember that that's there. And, oh, there's not a door on this side. I guess the door on this side is over here. We've still got three keys. Let's go ahead and put one to work. And this time, you see, we're, pa we're following the blue path. And we still have two keys left, and those would be the two really difficult, easy-to-miss keys that I mentioned. So you can imagine every first-time player thinking they're making progress here when they go up to the top. This is the room that has the surprise crab. That's right, you want to power up your sword when you're riding that up. You can imagine a lot of players coming up here and doing this, thinking this is the correct thing to do, but it's not. If you get to this point, you've got zero keys. If you've used all the obvious keys and those two really well-hidden ones are down below, well, guess what? Now you've got to do the whole loop again. you got to go down all the way to the bottom. Starting with the yellow path. Watch this. Wah! Eat it, son. Beautiful. And then you get here and you're like, oh, I'm missing a key. I guess i got to go around again. And this is why this dungeon has such a... Uh, a powerful reputation for being a terrible dungeon. There are YouTube videos about it, there are blog posts about it, but the things that people really hate about this dungeon... Uh, perhaps predominantly being... how long it takes the boots to... to take your boots on and off, but I think it's more than that. I think it's just... A lot of Zelda dungeons, there's another key door over here. So yeah, even if you go back into the dungeon and hunt for half an hour to find the little room you missed to get a key, as soon as we get up to the top here, there's another key door. So you really need to find all the keys to this point. I don't think I want to be this low, but... I do like how quickly I can just snap the hook shot up by using the accelerometer in the system. There's a great YouTube series by a much more popular YouTuber than I named, Mark Brown. He did a series called Boss Keys, where he looks at all of the Zelda dungeons from every single game, looks at the structure of them, looks at the sequence of actions you take for each Zelda dungeon. And he found a couple of different, like, Zelda dungeon archetypes. Like, some of them are very linear, in the sense that there's really only ever one obvious play way to go at a time. Whereas things like Water Temple have a much more branching structure to them. And I honestly believe that some players, even players that tell you that they love Zelda games, I really honestly believe that a lot of people get turned off by that style of dungeon design. Because it's very easy to get stuck. It's very easy to get trapped in a loop of doing like the same couple of actions over and over again without making any relevant progress and people get stuck and they get frustrated being stuck in a game is usually seen as a bad thing and i think it's pretty much impossible to complete the water temple without getting stuck for long periods of time so when you combine that with one of the central items of the dungeon being the iron boots Got them both with one swipe. That's awesome. Let's not get our tunic eaten by this like-like. If you find the right spot, we can shoot right in between... There we go. Right in between these spikities here. Two shots will kill a like-like. World leaders and shield eaters have many likes alike. Not sure if you knew that. But yeah, I think at some level, what really turns people off about this dungeon in particular is how twisted and knotted and branching it is, and it really makes you think about the dungeon. You can't just... 
It's not just I go into a room and there's a locked door. Oh, I guess I gotta go back and take the path I saw before. We're gonna kill him much like we killed the Stalfos, I think. We're gonna wait for him to make a move. No? There we go. That's what we want to do. Get that low stab in there. I think they made this boss different in this version of the game. Like, he's a lot tougher in the 64 version. Like, when you try to swing at him, he'll jump up on your sword. Or maybe it's just that I've got the bigger on sword. And last time I played this game, on, I keep saying N64 version, I played on the GameCube version. I probably fought him with a master sword, and maybe the bigger on sword, just maybe the arc of it is different. I don't know. Or they changed the boss, but either way. Uh, my, my main point was that I love being stuck in games. The the sensation of being stuck and not knowing what to do next, provided I have faith in the game designers, provided I my the game has not ruined my faith yet. If I have faith that I'm just missing something clever, the sensation of being stuck is not a negative thing for me. And nothing got me stuck like the Water Temple. And kind of bringing it back to something I mentioned before, in Twilight Princess, we want to get down here. Now that our long our, our hook shot is a long shot now, so it shoots much, much farther. I mentioned Twilight Princess has that stupid ice block <coughs> puzzle where bomb arrows don't work and bombs don't work and nothing works and you're stupid and Link's stupid, but oh, you got to turn into a wolf and roll into a wall and that works for some reason that doesn't make any sense. That kind of thing destroys my faith in a game. We want you to think of the one actual solution that we thought of. And no, no other solution will work. We've designed this puzzle so you got to go to wolf form and roll into the wall, my brother. If you don't do that, I guess you just get wrecked, nerd. Oh, that was it. Oh, I love that the little sneaky part of the dungeon up there, by the way. That's really, that's really good. I enjoy that quite a bit. Okay, though. Now we have the long shot, and I'm pretty sure we want to lower the water all the way back down. And I think now there's something we can do with that block we pushed into position earlier. Better take care of him first. That's a very tough line for game designers to walk, and it's something that a lot of game designers don't even consider. If you've ever played a bad, like, adventure game where you have to like think of moon logic you know well, how was I supposed to know to do that that doesn't make any sense what the mm. that's what I mean that that's gonna break your faith in a game so you have puzzle games like I actually don't know where to go next I have a key still there's a couple more treasure boxes we need to get Do we want to go back down? I think there's something on each floor. If I remember correctly, there's something on each floor we can do now that we have the long shot to collect the rest of the keys, but I can't remember precisely what. Well, that's not it. Yeah, that's not going to be it. So we are a little bit stuck now, but... It'll be fine. It'll be fantastic. Don't worry. We don't want to go the yellow route yet. I don't think. Shout out to Nicholas Valentiner for sponsoring this video, and to everybody who helps make my channel possible by supporting me on Patreon.